namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa aparuta de sangamata satara e sorvanta bamunjantu satang. This afternoon, you, I'll give a Dhamma reflection, pointing to the way it is. <clears throat> Rather than how it, life should be. And in our lives, we, all of us know how life should be about how a man should be, a woman should be, a government should be. So that's no problem for any of us. We're full of ideas about how life should be. But the Buddha's teachings pointed to the way it is, the way experience through these conscious forms is like this. And so we, instead of trying to create an ideal society, ideal marriage, ideal political system, and there's nothing wrong with that, ideals have their purpose. But life is not an ideal, it's the way it is, it's about change, birth and death. It's about greed, hatred and delusion. It's about karma. All that is born must die. All that begins ends. So these constant reflections were going against the conditioning of, of uh, modern life, materialism, modern education, modern science, psychiatry and all the rest because they're based on the idea of progress and trying to create ideal systems where we don't suffer. <clears throat> That's completely fair and just and right and perfect. <clears throat> so listening to the news of the day, you realize how uh, you know, ideals uh, are beautiful in themselves, but they're imagined. They're imagi images that we create in the mind. So reflecting on the way it is doesn't require imagining anymore. It doesn't require thinking, but just trusting, be the puto, the witness to the way it is. As you experience life and with your individual form and karmic inheritance. So this is, you know, the contemplating the Four Noble Truths over 56 years. <clears throat> you know, I realize what a profound teaching this really is. Taking the, the common human problem that we all don't want suffering. And we want happiness, we want to be happy, we want to feel safe, secure, stable, loved, appreciated, and we're afraid of, of the opposites of instability, of loss, of being rejected or looked down on. So as a personality, as an ego, when I identify myself with the physical form, this human body sitting here talking to you, when I identify with it, <clears throat> then it you know, then I'm operating from a conditioned perspective, very limited, conditioned by so many 
views and opinions, so many memories. When you've been living this long, you have many memories to live with. You have certain emotional habits that arise in situations. You watch your body getting old and not operating very well anymore. And if you take that personally, then it's suffering. Like old age, if you identify with an aging body, it's suffering. Because old age is, is not a particularly ideal, ideal in our mind. We'd like to discover immortality, where our bodies stay young and beautiful forever. That would be the dream. But when we awaken to Dhamma the way it is, then we are aware that, that every, all these bodies get old and die. That's, that's the way it be, that's karma. What is born gets old and dies is the law of karma. Cause and effect. If there's no birth, then there's no death. But out of ignorance, we identify with birth, with the forms that we, uh, with the physical form, with the states of mind, with the karmic habits we've developed in a lifetime or like this. We identify with them, and then they, in old age, they get more ingrained, and and you feel, you know, very. Uh, kind of uncertain about the future. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 89? <laughs> so that's... <laughs> I don't worry about that. <clears throat> but the... But the witness to this is deathless. That's what doesn't die, that's not karmic. It's not a condition. So that witness, as Ajahn Chah would use the mantra puto, Buddha, the Thai pronunciation of Buddha is puta. Translated as the knowing, because we know, we know we're conscious at this moment, that's a fact. One thing we can be sure is that we're conscious. We identify consciousness as inside the body, so it becomes personal. My consciousness and yours are separate. So that, that kind of separation leads to suffering, because when we see, when we feel separate from each other, then there's always love and hate, like and dislike, agreement, disagreement, acceptance and rejection. Because that's the way the thinking mind operates. It's all about opposites, dual, dualistic opposites. So when we talk about happiness, we talk about you know, the kind of happiness we usually have memories of, when we get what we want, when life is, when we're young and healthy and everything's going the way I want it to and, and uh, there's a sense of stability and certainty and appreciation and respect in life, that's what one wants as a person. But as a puto, as a witness, the witness knows that that very wish for happiness on the sensual forms, material forms, is impermanent. It's a Nietzsche. So now we're operating from wisdom rather than from conditioning. So conditioning, like here at Amarvati, was very international Sangha. Different age groups, we have males, females, different European nationalities, Asian nationalities, and 
So we're all conditioned in, in quite different ways. Our cultural conditioning can be quite different. Generations can be quite different. So conditioning is, is, a, is one of the obstructions to enlightenment, to seeing things as they really are. Because coming from an American conditioning, you know, we brought up in a in a in an in an idea in a society that uh, grasps ideas, ideals. And in my generation of Americans was very idealistic. <clears throat> So, you know, and so I can recognize that. I witness the, the idealism that I developed as a child, as a teenager, as a young person. And now at 88, you know, these ideals st still come into consciousness. But the relationship to them is they are conditions that arise and cease. They're phenomena is when they, who's uh, are karmic, they're not ultimately true or real. So you, by witnessing the true nature of phenomena, you begin to let go of it. You lose your fascination, your involvement with conditions, with phenomena, with sankharas. The ego, or sakaditi, is, you know, the very first fetter, the fetter that blinds us to the path. And that best is translated as the identity that we have with our physical body. <clears throat> because that's one thing we, we take for granted. I am this, this body, I have to live with it. 24 hours a day. And whether it's young or old, male or female, healthy, strong, sick or weak, or whatever, because it changes according to other conditions. So in this past year, when I went to uh, North America, it's quite a, you know, six months I've been away from Amarvati and uh, going to the country I was born into. Went, first we flew from London to Seattle, the Northwest, and that was, um, you know, it was, uh, just observing, being born and raised and educated in Seattle my generation in the 19, in, from the 1934 through the 1950s, that was, Seattle was a kind of an outpost of uh, the United States. It's called the gateway to Alaska, <laughs> and it was a seaport. And so it was a kind of pleasant enough city, quite attractive city. But now it totally looks different than what I remember. In just 60, 70 years, the, the total appearance of Seattle is hardly recognizable to me. <clears throat> so in terms of being an old man, thinking about, well, it's not like it used to be, because this is what old men, old women do the good old days, and uh, I remember ordaining as a monk with Lung Pa Cha, we didn't have iPhones or iPads or anything like that. It was tough. This is what old monks talk about. So when I go to Thailand, I can grumble with the other old monks about the modern generation. But the difference is that you're aware of it. It's just part of the game of, of your life that you're experiencing, 
without grasping it, without taking it seriously, not living by it and creating moods of resentment or or just being critical and obstructive as an as an old person. I went to see my sister who turned 90 in last March and uh, she'd been she was in a in a special care home for people losing their memories for dementia. So my sister was two years older than I am, and uh, she, the care home was very nice in, in Vancouver, Washington, which is in the southern part of Washington State, and uh, she looked very frail and passive, like she didn't have much energy. <clears throat> and uh, I could talk to her about the past. She'd remember everything about our childhood, our teenage, our college days. <clears throat> but just immediate kind of experiences she'd forget. So when I brought her a, a, an art book from the National Museum in London about Raphael's paintings, my sister is an artist, and Raphael paints beautiful Madonna portraits. All his Madonnas are absolutely beautiful. And so that um, my sister looked through the book and with great attention on the beautiful artwork, and she's a devout Christian, and then she put it aside, and later on she forgot who gave her the book. So this was, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an obvious gift, and yet just a few minutes before she looked at it, I gave it to her, and then when she was finished, she couldn't remember. So this is what memory's like. You lose your memory because memory's acquired. Consciousness doesn't remember anything. It uses memory, so a memory arises in consciousness. But pure consciousness, undifferentiated consciousness, featureless consciousness, doesn't have memory, doesn't have language. So when we talk about the deathless, or Neroda, the third noble truth, <clears throat> We're taking refuge in pure conscious awareness. And our relation to consciousness is then one of being that pure conscious awareness where we get beyond our memories, our conditioning, our language, dependent on language, on definitions, on defining phenomena. And we find our true nature, our true stability in awareness. So this is the gift of our humanity, is that we can actually do this. We're not just conditioned form subject to karmic, uh, the karma of, of the, this particular species. Because we can, and so the word Buddha itself means awakened consciousness. It's aware of the way things are. It's not telling you how things should be. It's not about scolding you or criticizing any of us. No matter how saintly or naughty we might be as individuals, it's not about that. But it's stable and here and now, and we know we're conscious. But the force of habit is very strong. <clears throat> so when I first realized this, had insight into this, it was so easy to just fall back and being Ajahn Sumato and being senior monk or junior monk or whatever uh, convention I was participating in at the time, because I didn't know any better. I had the insight. And that insight was, a, was an opening. 
an insight experience to the way it is and trusting in that. I developed a practice around silence because silence isn't, doesn't have, a, you know, it doesn't have language or memories. So I began to notice what I call the sound of silence. Just through reminding myself, going through the, the uh, using the Buddhist teachings in the suttas, that all conditions are not self, and not that. And that was very difficult at first, because I was very, you know, I couldn't figure out who was aware, who was it that was aware of life. It always recurred to me as a, and as an individual person experiencing life. Because experience we, ha we have through senses, through eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. That's experience through the sensual conditions of our form. And those are what, you know, about love and hate, like and dislike, success and failure, praise and blame. You know, we live in a society that is basically based on the illusions of reality as a material condition. And so what's very material for all of us is the form, the body. And we have to live with it till it passes away, till it dies. So, you know, whatever the body might be, if it's disabled or healthy or male or female, you know, whatever our karmic conditioning might present to us, all the problems around gender that manifest at this time are imagined problems, my identity with sexual orientation or gender orientation. But is, that, is any of that really what anyone is? You know, we choose maybe our identities or our karma forces us to identify with, in certain ways with life or experience that we have as individuals. But what we really are, this is what we're here for, here at Amaravati, is to realize ultimate reality, absolute reality. So it's, you know, I want to give the information of what you really are, rather than tell you what I believe you are, think you are as an individual person. Because that, when we identify with silence, with conscious, pure conscious awareness, then there's no, the differences in forms and karmic Con connections no longer seem terribly important. We don't create endless problems about individual karma or appearance or race or gender or nationality or political preference. But when we don't know that, then we take sides, <clears throat> we have preferences, we have wars, arguments, conflicts, because on the condition level, we're all different. We can't always agree on the same things. What we call good taste, or other people consider poor taste, or what I particularly like, what I prefer. You know, am I going to impose that on all of you because I feel right that my taste is better than yours? And that always 
taste of arrogance and conceit, that my particular condition, experience of life is somehow the authority. And so you should uh, respect that, that I'm the authority on how things should be done. Or one can be aware of that if one tends towards that kind of arrogance or conceit. You can be aware of it. So being abbot of a monastery, being senior monk, being a ajahn, being a teacher, being put into these uh, prominent positions. Now, if we take that personally, then, you know, then we find it very difficult because it, some people agree with me on issues and other people don't agree, or some like me, some don't like me, and on and on like that, then you, if you take everything personally, then it's, it's an endless crisis or problem. Life becomes just uh, difficult because being head of a monastery, being a senior monk, is like this. People look at you in a different way than when you're junior monk or junior nun. And that's just the way things are. The sense of senior and junior are illusions, imagine images that we create. They're conventions only. So like our Vinaya, we had the Padimok this morning, chanted 227 precepts. That's the, that's the uh, convention we use in this particular tradition. So the Thai forest tradition, Theravada Buddhism is a tradition. It's not absolute reality. Vinaya is a convention that the Buddha encouraged to diminish the endless problems that communities of monks or nuns create on personal levels. So we all agree to live by these precepts in terms of action and speech, but in terms of emotion, mental conditioning, idealism, and so forth, we're all quite different. But the practice, the Bhatibhata, Bhavana, is seen through these illusions. It doesn't mean we, we have to get rid of the forms or the ideals or the conventions, but it's learning to use conventions for awareness that makes life much more easy to live in a community where we all agree I agree on just how we act with our bodies and speak with our mouths. So the, there's more harmony, it tends to be more harmony in a, in a strict Vinaya monastery than in monasteries where they don't respect Vinaya very strictly, because then it's each one to themselves. Like here at Amaravati, we can we come from you know different as I was saying before different international backgrounds. So we have different ways of thinking about the same situation. But Vinay is a guide and a helpful tool rather than an end in itself because it's only conventional, it's not ultimate reality. And what we call ultimate reality is Dhamma, we take refuge in ultimate reality. Which is beyond convention, beyond form. It's where earth, fire, water and air cease, where heaven and hell have no footing find, 
where male and female no longer exist. That's Niroda, third noble truth. So as long as our identities are with me trying to meditate to get enlightened, because that's how I started out, uh, because that's all I knew when I first entered the Sangha, was I wanted uh, to get rid of suffering. I wanted to become enlightened. So I worked very hard as a separate, as a dedicated monk, keeping the vinaya strictly according to the tradition at Wat Pha Phong. But then reflecting on the results of me trying to get samadhi, me as a person, a dedicated, good intention man trying to get all the right things, to speak always properly and to act properly with the body and to, to live by this tradition and, and get the appreciation and respect that comes from such behavior, as a person, one liked it very much. I could perform in that good monk tradition quite well. But then as I developed more trust in awareness and silence, I began to see if to, with all my good intentions, hard work, efforts, dedication to, to meditation practices, I still managed to experience a lot of suffering. I liked being a hermit where I could go off and not experience the conflicts that arose with other human beings. But Lung Po Cha, every time I tried to go off and to find the hermitage that I longed for, he'd bring me back into the midst of the Sangha. I thought, why is he doing that? Why doesn't he get, so I can get my samadhi together, I need a, a better, I'm too busy at Wat Pa Pong. It's become famous, and there's so many people coming and going, so many monks. You know, it's, you know, and I started complaining about it because I could think of better places to be. But then reflecting on the complaining mind, I began to listen to myself grumbling. And when I would go off, I spent six months on this mountain in Sukhumakorn province, Pupek Mountain, getting away from all the problems of being a junior monk training at Wat Pa Pog, living on top of a, what was in, in the, European terms, just a high hill, but it, in Thai terms, it was called a mountain. And of course, it was a disaster. I caught malaria. I, be, I became obsessed with dislike for one of the monks that were with me. And, and I became so obsessed with aversion and then malaria. After six months, I went back to Wat Pa Pong and kind of surrendered to Lung Pa Cha's suggestions. But that's learning experience, learning to, from experience and see what brings peace, where silence really is. It's here and now. It's not on top of a hill, in, on top of a mountain in Northeast Thailand. It's not in a perfect, silent place where the, nobody can uh, contradict you or cause any disturbance to you in any way, where there are no dogs barking or airplanes flying overhead, and you're all by yourself, <clears throat> and that's... That's the ideal I treasured. But the reality of it, I brought so much anger in because of some silly view I had of this other monk, a Thai monk. 
I was, couldn't let go of it. And I'd become obsessed with aversion. But due to the Vina, I didn't strangle the monk, but I felt like it many times. And so this was I'm getting malaria where you're just totally kind of weak and helpless. So the ideal place, the hermitage where everything's perfect, you know, is, is an imagination. We can imagine a perfect place right now and in, in sitting here in Amaravati. But Amaravati's like this at this time. And it, you know, so we began to just relax with it, with life as we experience it, rather than trying to manipulate conditions for our own personal benefit, following our own conceits and arrogance, or ideals that we cherish. So Lung Po Chau is always emphasizing monastery if they have, if they teach Dhamma, and respect Vinaya, then that's the perfect place to live. Then from, from Vancouver, I spent about four or five days visiting my sister, and then Arjun Asok and I, with two friends, Richard Smith and Bob Schmidt, met us in Seattle and they drove us to Vancouver, then drove us all the way to Abayagiri in California. And we were only in California about three days when my sister passed away. So that it wasn't a surprise because she looked like she was rather eager to go. And I got the impression she was really surviving just to see me. Because she knew I was coming to visit her. So Bob and Richard kindly drove, drove us back to uh, Vancouver for the funeral. And then on the way back from the funeral to Abayagiri, all of us caught COVID. So, so when I arrived at Abayagiri, I, was, I had to be quarantined for 10 days. So that's the way life is. COVID is like this. You know, people ask me, was it that bad? It wasn't, it's like a flu or just an annoying chest problem. But for me, it was not uh, a totally unpleasant experience. We, Ajahn Pasano, Ajahn Yaniko, arranged for us to stay in a very nice house quite separate from the monastery, and so uh, nice weather and good company. But uh, then we flew from San Francisco to visit Ajahn Viradamo in uh, Canada, T. Sarana. <coughs> and Ajahn B. arranged for a, a tourist trip to Newfoundland, the most remote part of Canada, or one of the most remote parts, an island off the coast of Nova Scotia. So we all went to, to Newfoundland, and there it was uh, 10 days of just sightseeing and pleasant experiences, quite beautiful island a place I never, ever thought I'd ever visit. And then we went to, flew from Halifax in Nova Scotia to, to Boston, where Ajahn Gianto met us and spent the remaining months, three months, we entered second Pansa at Jedwana. So on the whole, there's pleasant memories now of Newfoundland and Tisarna and Jetawana and Abhagiri and seeing my sister, 
memories not so pleasant of COVID, but there are memories right now. And to emphasize, memories are empty phenomena. You know, they're not, they're not, they, they come and go like the rain here in England. It starts raining, then it stops. Memories come according to conditions and then fly away. Where did they go? During the time in Newfoundland, I heard the news that George Sharm passed away here in England, in London. And he's been a very good friend for over 30, 40 years. And he was the <clears throat> person that really invited Lung Pa Cha and myself to come to England. So all these monasteries in, in Europe that connected to us are, you know, really the result of George Sharp's insight into wanting to establish a proper forest, Thai forest monastery in the UK. He had that main objective in his mind was to, uh, his teacher was uh, a man called Kapilawan, he was a, an English person who ordained sometimes and disrobed, but he established the English Sangha Trust in 1956 and the purpose of that trust is to establish dwellings in the United Kingdom for Theravadan monks to come and live. And so the English Sangha Trust was, was established to est establish a Sangha, not just meditation teachers or Buddhist missionaries or in independent monks, but to establish Sangha, where you have a community that carries on the tradition in an intelligent and wise way, and whose purpose is to realize Nibbana, the end of suffering, where earth, fire, water, and air cease. So in consciousness, earth, fire, and air, earth, fire, water, and air cease. It's called Niroda, or the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering. So when I look back at my journey through North America, it might be my last trip there, and um, I did feel homesick for Amravati. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, but I didn't uh, grasp it. Then uh, it was generally a, a memories are very pleasant, meeting Ajahn Virdhamo, Ajahn Janto, Ajahn Pasano, friends from way back, Ajahn V, it was, oh, it was one of my oldest friends. He helped establish what Banana Chat in Thailand, came with me to live in England and helped uh, with the original years in uh, Chitturst. George Sharp, we uh, scattered his ashes a few days past at Chitturst. <clears throat> and George always seemed to think he he hadn't accomplished anything. So in spite of the great gift he, he gave us, he never really seemed to uh, take credit for it. It seemed to always surprise him that it that it's developed to this extent here in Europe and the UK. He was, uh, when I met him, he was well informed about the, he'd read the scriptures, the suttas. Uh, he was a very intelligent man and had uh, a knowledge of Vinaya. He was a, 
a friend of Ajahn Panyawado, who is a British monk who lived in London and went to Thailand and ordained as a bhikkhu. And so he was well informed by Ajahn Panyawado of how to use the Vinaya and, and took his cues from Ajahn Mahabua in Udon to establish uh, the, this tradition in the West. And Ajahn Panyawado never wanted to return to England. We invited him many times, but he seemed to be very content living in, in Thailand, and he passed away a few years ago there in Thailand. So his portraits over there on the wall had a portrait painted of him to remember Ajahn Panyawada, who was one of the elder Buddhist, Western Buddhist monks who encouraged the establishment of this tradition here in the UK. But getting back to the important issues, such as awareness. That's what we call the gate to the deathless. Aparuta desang amatasataura. Amatasataura is the gate or the door to the deathless. It's like an opening we have as individual human personalities. And we call it mindfulness or awareness, consciousness. Consciousness is not a sankhara. Consciousness through the senses is a sankhara. So in the five khandhas, uh, you know, the senses are very delicate conditions that are subject to all kinds of other conditions. <clears throat> so we're conscious, we experience consciousness through the senses, so we, we attach to the objects of sense, <clears throat> because that's the material world for us. What we call the real world is what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think and feel. So that's always dependent upon sense organs, ayatanas, to function. Because pure consciousness doesn't have sense organs. Pure consciousness is featureless, endless, has no beginning or end, it's here and now. And it's what we all truly are. And when we begin to contemplate, ref, continually reflect on this truth, on this reality, we're no longer trying to convince ourselves that as a person I'm, you know, I'm aware or I'm the ultimate reality. That whole sense of, of uh, personal identity falls away. So there's no person that's enlightened. To let go of the personality is the way to enlightenment. To realize your true identity is awareness, is through awareness. The Four Noble Truths are, you know, a really excellent, very succinct, very direct teaching the Buddha offered after his enlightenment which still is very appropriate to all our con uh, unique conditions, karmic conditions that we identify with because we begin to see through them. No longer are we the limited forms, the bodies, the habits, the emotions, the memories, that when we don't know this, when we're just conditioned to operate from the ego, from conventions, from thinking, then we, we're always limited to 
to the forms that we attach to. So that's what suffering is, being attached to the forms. And the formless, you can't attach to it. You can't attach to consciousness because you are that. It's like trying to see your own eyes. You can't do it. So consciousness is pure, deathless. It's freedom from desire, freedom from suffering, and it's what we all really are. And it's impersonal. So I offer this as a reflection.